By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to look at some seven point singleton. It's actually quite a special video because this whole video is a deck tech video. So we're looking and I'm saying we because I'm doing this together with Brian Wiseman. Brian and myself are going to look at two decks, a deck from Sebastian and a deck from Julian. And while we're at it, we are also going to discuss seven point singleton as a whole. And yeah, we just we're, we're kind of brainstorming, discussing some choices, sharing opinions about the formats, also a little bit about Swedish versus other formats. Um, and maybe it's it's nice to know because this is kind of an introduction and in a moment you're going to listen to the actual footage, you know, my, my uh, call with Brian Wiseman, um, how this whole thing came to be because Seven Point Singleton is organized by a very, very nice, nice guy, um, uh, Thomas Ribé, a Frenchman. Uh, together with uh, uh, Mikael and uh, I, I believe he's also French and they've organized this format and he really enjoys like getting his format out there makes sense right so he's asked me a few times to do a live stream and now he asked me can I send you a video and can you then do the commentary uh, together with Brian so I said you know what yeah let's let's see if that works so I contacted Brian we talked a little bit to see if there was a click and then we decided to make this video together and the idea was, the initial idea was just to do a little bit of deck tech going through these two decks and then actually going to the match. But we ended up talking for a very long time about just these two decks. And then we're st we still did the commentary. Uh, but because of the length, I decided to um, cut it in half for you. So this is part one where we just discussed the deck deck and we also talked generally about Seven Point Singleton. So if that's something that you're interested in, this is definitely the video for you. And then in part two uh, that I will post next week, um, I will show you the actual games. So we're also going to show you the games. It's not just discussing the decks and then saying, okay guys, <laughs> you know, that's it. Uh, have a coffee, take a break. No, uh, I'm also going to post uh, the actual uh, video with the games, but just because of the length, I decided to divide that into two pieces. Um, so yeah, that's that's all I have to add to this as an introduction to this video. So um, enjoy, let me know in the comments below if you like these type of videos and who knows, maybe I'm going to make more of them uh, in, in the future. We'll just have to see. So let me know what you think and um, let's go. Let's take a look at the deck tech video. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to talk seven point singleton and we're going to look at a quarterfinal match that was played in November. And I've got a guest commentator here, none other than Brian Weissman. Hey guys, how are you doing? Glad to be here. And we are going to start right, Brian, by looking at the deck lists of both of these players. Shall we start with Sebastian? Yeah, um, I uh, I wanted to kick it off with this deck. He's going to be sitting on the left side during the actual matches, so it made sense to start with him. Although, actually, I don't have his list up here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no worries. He's, he's um, playing with switch, white. I, 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 yeah, I just switched over to it. Sorry, I had the other one up. Um, yeah, so Sebastian's playing a, um, after it looks like a series of playing with mono red a number of times, it looks like he switched over to playing a, a very different type of creation. It's a black-white, I guess I would classify this as a control deck. Um, it's it's certainly a challenge to play a, a deck like this in the format. If you notice, this um, his his deck list is really kind of indicative of, of, a, of a deeper deck construction quandary in old school singleton which is that um unlike unlike modern formats where lots and lots of the cards have only a single color requirement in old school as you can see right here there's a there's a preponderance of cards that cost double white or double black exactly, exactly. And, and, and that is a problem and maybe that's the reason he went for just two colors do you think with in old school singleton you can try three colors yeah, well, that's it, that's actually um, that relates to my first stab at the format. Um, when I was first introduced to the format a couple of months ago, the first deck I put together was basically a blue white control deck, and then I kind of reasoned, well, blue white is strong, but it has some fundamental issues, uh, primarily with removal and with finishing the game. So I kind of wanted to play red in it as well. And when I was putting the deck together, I really noticed the fact that I had so many cards in the deck that cost double white, double blue, and Splashing both red and black was a real challenge. I still tried to do it and was sort of somewhat successful, but I found when I was testing the deck that 
a lot of the games came down to really whether or not I was able to draw mana. It, it, like the spell part of the game was almost incidental. It just came down to mana. And if your opponent drew any type of land destruction at all or a strip mine, and pretty much every deck is playing with strip mine because um, it doesn't, yeah. because it doesn't use uh, it, it, it doesn't have any points. And um, as you mentioned before, the format has an allowance in it of seven points, where uh, the most expensive cards cost four, and um, there's a handful of cards that cost three, a handful of cards that cost two. I won't go get into the I won't get into the points list exactly because it's fairly extensive, but most of the best cards in the format cost some amount of points with a few exceptions. And um, cards that you see that are showing up in all the deck lists because they don't cost any points are cards like Chaos Orb and uh, Strip Mind and, and to a lesser extent cards like Ice you, Manipulator shows up in tons and tons of lists too. Yeah. Do you think those cards, that, you know, the regular, the usual suspects, I guess, should they be uh, given a point? I don't, never yeah, there. I've thought about that too, but I don't think so. Um, as much as you want to encourage diversity in deck design in a format that's singleton, mm -hmm. I think that Chaos Orb and Strip Mine particularly are necessary cards because they give every every deck and every archetype really an opportunity to, to interact with every type of permanent. And if you're if you're trying to play, for example, Mono Green, which is a deck that a couple of people have taken a stab at, well, Mono Green back in in old school days, this is in the era before cards like Planeswalkers and stuff. You just there's just a whole range of permanents you can't really deal with, and if you don't have strip mine, if you don't have chaos orb, like for example in this deck, uh, how does a how does a mono black deck with the exception of like a sinkhole, how does it kill a problematic land like a library of Alexandria or a tabernacle of Pendra Vale, or a card like Maze of Ith or Island of Whack Whack? If you just if you don't have those two cards, then if your opponent just draws a couple of really troublesome lands you just don't have any way to deal with them and you spend the whole game just kind of staring at the permanent and losing to it so you, as you, powerful you, you, as powerful and universally played as those cards are yeah. i think that it doesn't make any sense to just make all the utility type spells cost a point because then you just don't have any room for putting stuff that's interesting into your deck yeah that's true actually because i'm playing a lot of uh, old school swedish and you always play with your chaos orb and your strip mine so you already have two answers to all those troublesome lands in the format and you usually have to reserve two or three other slots to deal with all those difficult lands yeah exactly i mean i've, I've yeah. talked i've talked extensively in the past and written about my um my issues with the swedish version of old school particularly because lands are so oppressive and so powerful in that format because of only a single strip mine particularly um, the unrestricted Misha's Factory in Swedish, which is in essentially every deck, certainly in every competitive deck, runs four factories. And with only one strip nine to combat them, you have this sizable portion of games where one person just draws a lot of factories and the other person is just helpless, basically. They can't deal with them and they just lose to the person's lands before the game, before the game really even gets underway or before there's any ability to stop them. And... Um, Fortunately, this singleton format has restricted Misha's Factory, which I think is kind of a good thing. I have a I have a half written article that's, um, that's yeah. I just wanted to say, luckily, we don't have to have that discussion because I have a different opinion. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can, we can save that for another time. I want to talk about uh, Sebastian's deck here before we get exactly. To so, if you look I, I love the funny art. Yeah. So I saw when I saw this deck list, actually, I was really quite surprised. Um, I was quite surprised to see that it did so well, primarily because if you look at it. There's, there's something really missing in this deck. And in my opinion, it's missing about three to four land. And if um, ah, Sebastian yeah. actually won the event, the first event that I played in, he was playing a, a mono red deck. And I lost to him, I think, in the third round of the tournament. And he went on to actually win the whole thing. And when I went back and looked at his deck list, I was utterly shocked to see that he was only playing 20 lands in his mono red deck, which could work in a traditional mono red beatdown deck where your average cmc is probably less than two for your spells you know running 12 cards that cost one and and maybe 16 cards that cost two and a handful of threes his deck had an average converted mana cost of almost four and it had five five x spells spells that cost six and seven mana and he was only running 20 lands and he seems to have continued that trend somehow on into this deck where he has as you can see what is that that's uh seven planes and a scrubland and a city of brass and he's got a six he played 20 20 lands that produce mana i think and then i'm um, yeah that's right 20 um, lands that produce mana and a felwar stone yeah. in a deck at least the, the converted cmc in this deck is lower than his red deck 
but he has 15 cards that cost double black or double white and only 10 white sources and 10 black sources. So wow. he, he's, he's figured out something about how to uh, successfully draw double colors in both of his colors that I, I, I clearly have not figured out in 26 years of playing Magic. Um, I'm not really sure what's, how he's accomplishing it, but he's clearly, he must be playing extremely well and drawing extremely well to get this far in the event. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not he stumbles on mana, on mana or has mana problems in his match against his opponent. But the rest of the deck is pretty interesting. I mean, it has, I think, a lot of the usual suspects that you'd expect. He has some neat tech cards in the deck. Um, Hell's Caretaker is a card you don't really see played very often, except in maybe reanimator strategies. So um, it's neat to see that card. I, I see that he has a card called Banshee, which is another, <laughs> another card I remember experimenting with years ago when the dark came out. And... Uh, the combination of Banshee and Spirit Link is pretty fantastic. Because you can... also, also a card that eats mana, by the way, for Banshee. Yeah, oh, you mean eats mana in the sense of is a mana sink? Yeah, yeah, exactly, if you want to use it. Um, yeah. Because what does it do again? You tap and pay X, right? And then you deal damage to any target, and then you deal half of that damage to yourself? Yeah, or, or it's the other way around. You take full damage and the Banshee deals half the damage, I think. Ah, uh, that's probably it's it. It's covered that's up. Yeah, I think I think that's the way that it works. I don't think you have the damage to yourself. I think you take double the damage the Banshee deals, but it does give you a repeatable source of burn on the table if your opponent's unable to deal with it. And the format's got lots and lots of small utility type creatures. You can see a bunch of them in the deck. He's got Witch Hunter, Preacher, Argivian Archaeologist, Royal Assassin. Those are all one one toughness creatures that if you have a Banshee in play, you basically just dominate your opponent's ability to play anything that has one health. And uh, you can just take, you can just use it to completely hold the board down, particularly in combination with the Kumbaj Witches, which is another very, very powerful card actually in general that I think is quite underplayed. I know that you, uh, you're, you're a fan of the Prodigal Sorcerer and Kumbaj Witches is Prodigal Sorcerer for, with more durability yeah. and, and it's a, it's a one, three for two, which is pretty good. Yeah. Which is, which is very, very good. Exactly. I mean, a one, three stat line for two mana that actually does something in old school, in old school format is pretty remarkable. And then, um, uh, Sebastian's definitely a, a big fan of artifacts. He's got um, Triskelion, which is another card that you see kind of universally in, in most of the decks. I actually didn't run it in my control deck because it costs six, but that was probably wrong to do given how impactful the card is. And what's cool is that he actually has some recursive combos with the Triskelion. He's, he has both Ar Argivian Archaeologist and the Hell's Caretaker to go and recycle the ability. And because you can actually shoot the arms off and then immediately return it back back into play on the same turn, you can actually use it to kill off something huge, like as big as a Shivan or a Mahamodi. Uh, and other than that, he, um, as far as other interesting tech cards, he's got uh, Taunus's Coffin. Yeah, which, Taunus's Coffin. Yeah, which is a card that was, if people remember back to the old 6th edition rules, Taunus's Coffin reached peak power back when they uh, had the rule set that allowed you to stack damage in combat and then remove a creature from combat and still have the damage resolve. I don't know if you... I don't know if you played in an era when that was a thing, but um, it made the card just unbelievably strong because if you had something like a Sarah Angel in play, you could you could deal four damage to your opponent's Sarah and then put your Sarah in the coffin before it died. <laughs> and their Sarah would die and yours would live. But even though you can't do that anymore, you can use Taunus's Coffin to protect your guys. You can also use Taunus's Coffin to keep one of their guys um, held down until you can deal with it another way. And then you can also use Taunus's Coffin on Triskelion. So at the end of the turn, you just throw the Triskelion into the coffin and then untap the coffin. The Triskelion pops out and it gets its arms back and you can shoot again exactly. and again and again. It's really cool. And then he's got Serpent Generator, which I, I see a number of people playing with. I was surprised to see this in any deck list because it just seems like it's worse than the card, the Hive. Exactly. But, yeah. Why not play the Hive? Yeah. I don't understand that either. I guess maybe because of poison, but... Honestly, if you hit your opponent 10 times with Hive tokens, they're probably dead anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine a scenario where you're poisoning the guy to death. Um, I, I, I do like the idea of Serpent Generator and Hell's Caretaker, but that might as, might as well have been the Hive. Yeah, it just seems like Hive is just strictly better. And then as far as his points go, um, he's got a three-point card in the form of Demonic Tutor. He's got Land Tax over there at two, and then uh, Balance and Maze of Ith at one apiece. And it's interesting to see Land Tax at a, as a two-point card given the fact that it not only requires you to play white, but it also requires you to play with a, a lot of basic lands. Um, but I guess because people are really pushed in the direction of playing one to two colors, um, a, a good a good sizable portion of the decks, people aren't probably used to seeing old school decks with tons of basic lands in them. Because, you know, in regular old school format, you kind of want to play with, except for Blood Moon, right? You kind of want to play every dual land you can. 
So, Blood moon is is, is, a, is a danger, definitely. Yeah, yeah it's definitely danger. Although I think in the grass, yeah, yeah. In this format, it doesn't seem like Blood Moon has played a ton, just because uh, again the, the the mana color requirements on all the cards kind of push people in the direction of monocolor and and two color decks. But um, balance, of course, super powerful. He went with Demonic Tutor over Mind Twist, which I think is sort of an interesting choice in terms of power level. But because his deck is is kind of a toolbox of things, it, it does make. Uh, a great deal more sense. So very, very cool and interesting deck. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Let me uh, let me bring up the other list here. Yeah, definitely. Let's take a look at the deck of Julian here. And again, no red. I'm surprised here because usually red is very dominant in the singleton format, but this seems to be mono black. Yeah, um, it's a, it's a completely mono black deck list. He's got, um, let's see here. Uh, I'm looking at, at cards that are sort of that stand out to me. A lot of these cards seem like they're they're pretty obvious, pretty obvious. I see, black I see the wretched. Black. I think the wretched is really cool to see. Yeah, the wretched is is uh, is it sort of like a basilisk type effect? I need to, I don't recall off the top of my head exactly what it does. Let me bring it up on my, my iPad here. Do you remember what it what it does exactly? It is a two five creature, and I believe when you attack with it. Um, and somebody blocks it and the creature doesn't die, then you gain control of the creature. But I just have to look it up as well if it's not... Yeah, I'm looking at right at end, of, at end of combat, gain control of all creatures blocking the Wretched for as long as you control the yes. Wretched. Yeah. Interesting. And it's only when it gets blocked, which, which kind of sucks, or else you could have said, I'm going to use it as a blocker and I'm going to use my Nettling Imp, which is also in this list. Yeah, I notice he does have Nettling Imp as well, with both Royal Assassin and with Icy Manipulator. Yeah. Um, which is kind of an old classic combo. The rest of the deck, I, I tried to build Mono Black. It was one of the test decks that I built when I first started, when I was first introduced to the format. And I felt that fundamentally, um, it's, it's that same situation that exists in Swedish old school, where just Mono Black is just a little bit... A, a little bit early in terms of a strategy because as you know Swedish rules don't include Fallen Empires and Fallen Empires introduces Him to Torak as an effect and yeah. Him to Torak really elevates black from being I think very much like a B or C tier strategy up to pretty close to tier one just because the card is so powerful and disruptive and um, yeah, him, him is amazing definitely yeah I mean it's just it's so amazing the fact that you can just draw to Him to Torak early in the game and just pretty much win by turn two or turn three yeah. I think what I've seen in 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 Swedish with mono black deck decks is that they, they've always been aggressive. I think that's why Kumbach Witches didn't see a lot of play because they chose uh, Black Knight over Kumbach Witches, and then for the three drop, of course, the Hippie. Uh, but what I'm seeing as well now more is that they're using Underworld Dreams, which is also in this deck, to kind of inflict those last points of damage. Yeah, and that is, that's absolutely an advantage of playing mono black because I think Underworld Dreams in a singleton format where people are not playing with four disenchants main deck, um, the card gets a lot stronger because the games tend to be long and grindy and playing mono black gives you the ability to run, to cast spells that cost BBB quite easily. And, um, you know, you notice in Sebastian's list, he's not running Underworld Dreams because it's very, very hard for his deck. To, he, he literally has to draw a third of his black mana to cast it. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So this deck can cast it truly. One card that I, I do see in this version, I think it actually is in Sebastian's list as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, let me jump back to it. Is that, do you mean Gate to Phyrexia, perhaps? Yes, yes, you, you picked it exactly. Uh, uh, Gate to Phyrexia, I think Sebastian has it as well. Yeah, he does, he does. Yeah, there it is right there. Yeah, very a very cool card that was really... Um, Kind of woefully underplayed in in uh, back in the day, people just I think didn't didn't recognize how strong the card is. But repeatable artifact kill in a black in the color black is amazing. And when it came down to trading some sort of relatively weak black creature for your opponent's best artifact, like you know you've got a black knight in play or something like a drudge skeleton that's sitting around doing nothing, the ability to swap that and kill your opponent's jam day tome or something is pretty invaluable because otherwise you, black just doesn't have the ability to interact with artifacts. So really cool to see Gate to Phyrexia in both of those decks. Um, a very, very underplayed card. The rest of the rest of the mono black deck list looks like it's pretty straightforward. He's not using actually as many artifacts as I think you would expect. Some other interesting choices, he's using a Jalem Tome over, yeah. uh, over a Jam Day Yeah, over Jam Day Tome. I mean, I understand that the card is, it's cheaper to cast and activate, but it is a very slow format and um, Jam Day Tome is just, as we know, 
one of the most powerful cards in the entirety of old school format. And in my opinion, it's sort of an auto include in just about every deck list, unless you're running something really, really narrow and aggressive. So yeah, it's interesting to see that he's, I mean, he does play with an animate debt, but that's the only interaction he really has with his graveyard. Oh, he raised dead as well. Yeah, animate dead and raised dead. I mean, we're still a little ways away from, he's not running the Hell's Caretaker, but he doesn't really have, because he's not running a card like Triskelion, for example, he doesn't really have an ability to take take huge advantage yeah, of the card. It's more that I'm trying to find out why he's he chose the little book, as I call it, over, this, over the big book. Why he made that decision? Is it purely on speed? You, th uh, you think? I, I suspect it's just being he's just being um, you know he's paying respect to having a, a smooth curve of casting costs, so that having the jail and tome just gives him more things to do on three that are that are proactive rather than reactive. If you look at the amount of things that he does have that cost three, that he can just play in, into any type of board state. Like for example, he's got ashes to ashes, yeah. oubliette at three. Both of those are completely reactive. Um, Underworld Dreams, I guess, is proactive, so it's the Frozen Shade. But I think it probably just... My, my suspicion is it's just respect to Mana Curve. He sort of feels that by the time he gets up to four and five, he's going to want to be playing creatures there and doesn't have a lot of room to just play the, the Jam Day Tome. And because the format just doesn't have acceleration the same way that regular old school does, the four mana spells feel often feel really, really clunky when you draw multiples of them in your hand because you're kind of just reduced to... a, a a uh, situation where casting a four mana thing just eats up your entire turn and you can't do anything else. And in the situation of a jam day tome, this is not the kind of deck that wants to just draw a card and pass. It kind of wants to be doing something every turn. And that means that, um, that means that you're not going to just be sitting around with uh, a jam day tome untapped and the jail tome, because it only costs two gives you the ability to do something impactful at three and four mana, and then also draw a card to cycle through your lands and stuff. So that's probably why he did it. Um, I'm not sure if that's, I'm not sure if that's right, and I think that probably you could find room for it, but I think that's probably the reason why he did it. It's, it's definitely an interesting deck, and we'll see how these two match up against each other. I, obviously, the fact that he's mono-black means that he should be uh, a lot more consistent in terms of how his deck performs game after game against a deck that has such a difficult um, and awkward mana base. And he goes more for speed, right, Julian, I think, when I'm looking at this list and his opponent. Yeah, I mean, it's as speedy as mono black can be, right? But the problem is, is that speed in, in this format amounts to playing cards like Drudge Skeletons on turn two. So they're just, it's not that threatening. Like, unless he draws Black Knight or the Order of Ebon Hand, he can't really apply a lot of pressure early, even, even if he has things to play. It's just, the format just doesn't have that many threats. It's just kind of a, a, an overall overriding issue with, with singleton format. You can't play a critical mass of small things the way you can in regular old school where you can run, you know, Lions... Four lions, four factories, eight lightning bolts, Serendip of Freed at three. You know, you can just, you can be putting on, applying pressure and obviously some kind of pump nights at two. You can just start applying pressure on turn one. It's just really, really hard to do that in this format. Definitely. Interesting, by the way, as well, now that we're discussing this, is that people are not just, uh, are not playing um, uh, the mocks in here in these decks. Yeah, I think that that's because I think the moxes are honestly overpriced. Um, they cost three points on the on the points list, and if you're if you're choosing between a mox and a card like Demonic Tutor or Mind Twist, that's really kind of a no brainer in my opinion. It's just the moxes are so inconsistent, and they're and they tend to only really be strong if they're drawn early. And yeah, due, due yeah, to that yeah. problem, it's just you you have such a, a tight budget that devoting three of your points to a card that does literally nothing if you draw it, you know, five, six turns into the game in terms of what it's supposed to do, that's just, it, that's too hard to, uh, to include. Whereas a card like Demonic Tutor is going to be universally good no matter when you draw it. Even a card like Dark Ritual compared to something like Mox Jet. Dark Ritual is more powerful on turn one than Mox Jet. And it's also more powerful on turn five or turn six because you might use Dark Ritual to power out, um, a, a huge drain life to, to use pestilence to do a bunch of damage or to, or to cast a much bigger creature like a nightmare or something. I mean, obviously ritual. And of course, mind is, twist ritual. And yeah. Other. And mind twist ritual, of course yeah. is better. It's just like going to be a stronger card. And yet Mox jet is three points and dark ritual is only one. So I think that if I, if I had some ability to curate the format, I think that I would definitely look at making the moxes cost less points because they're not showing up really in any deck lists at all, except for maybe mono red. And the same thing is true for the mighty Black Lotus, actually. There's no question in my mind that Black Lotus is weaker than Soul Ring in this format and uh, probably does not deserve to be four points as strong as it is. I think I, it would be interesting to see Black Lotus at three. I think that it would show up 
it would show up in a lot more deck lists. Four points is just too much to spend on, on, a, on a card for that kind of an effect. Well, maybe they're listening. Maybe they're going to change it. Um, and we can go to the games right now. Yeah, let's go. See, I, know, uh, I know we've talked for a while, so I'm sure people are eager to... Uh, see how it's going to, uh, yep. to end up here. Okay, and that concludes part one of these two-part series. In part two, you can finally see some magic. <laughs> it's, it's quite a cliffhanger, isn't it? We're about to jump into the game, and then it's cut off. Uh, but anyway, keep an eye on the channel because next week I will be posting part number two and you can actually see the games and you can hear Brian and myself commentate and uh, it's interesting and it's been really interesting to already have this conversation uh, with Brian and to share ideas like his, his look on magic is very analytical and it's, it's really more from a professional player point of view than my personal uh, view on magic but it's so interesting to kind of hear those thoughts and to then kind of give my ideas back and kind of see where we end up and i think what's really important within our old school community and within magic um is just to be relaxed people have different opinions people enjoy different rule sets you know, whatever it's all good you know uh, we're all in here together we all enjoy magic we'll enjoy the old school format so to me personally, it doesn't matter if you tell me, you know, I want to have a four strip mine environment. Great, man. Go for it. Do it. Do whatever you want. I don't care if somebody tells me I don't want to play with reprints. Great, man. Go for it. Or if somebody comes to me that says, you know, I want to play with proxies. As long as, you know, the player that you're playing against or the tournament that you're competing in agrees with you. I think that's kind of the bare minimum, right? You do have to make some agreements within your play group about how to play it and also respect the rules when you're joining a specific tournament. That's at least what I always do is I'm not gonna complain about a specific rule set if I've voluntarily decided to join a tournament. When I join a tournament, I'm like, great, man, you're organizing something, fantastic, I'm in. Or great that you're doing it, it's not my cup of tea, go ahead. You know, there are formats that I enjoy more than other formats. And it's also good sometimes to get out of your comfort zone. Um, that's also an advice for myself to get out of my comfort zone and try some other formats. Uh, for example, I don't play a lot of Atlantic and you know sometimes I go out of my comfort zone and I try out Atlantic. It's pretty good, it's fun, it's it's another format, it's, it's fine, you know. Um, anyway, I'm rambling on again. This was uh, episode one, part one, where we discussed these two decks of Sebastian and Julian. Thank you very much, uh, guys, for sharing your game and sharing your deck lists for us to make this video. Also, thank you to Thomas uh, Thomas Ribe and to Mikael um, for yeah for asking us to do this. Keep an eye on the channel. Next week, I will get the uh, the match up. So if you're interested in that, it'll be right here on Timmy Talks. And I also would like to thank you, the viewer, for I wouldn't say watching, but it's more listening, I guess, listening to us rambling on about seven point singleton now if you want to support teamy talks if you want to support what i do and you want to help me to keep making content uh, you can do that very simply by just liking this video sharing it on your socials leaving a comment um, be a subscriber if you're not a subscriber yet just click that subscribe button and also you can click the notification bell and then you will be notified as soon as episode two part two of this series comes on the channel so you'll be the first one one of the first ones i should say to actually watch that second part. Now there's also a last thing, another thing you can do is you can become a patron of the channel. By becoming a patron, you can sponsor the show so you can help me financially to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm hoping in the future, I'm not there yet, but in the future with the help of all of you to just have one set day a week dedicated to the channel. So that's kind of what I'm going for right now. So if you wanna help me out, you can click on the info card that's appearing right now. That will take you to my Patreon page and you can already support me starting by $1 a month. Um, talking about the patrons, let's take a look at the end scroll and let's um, see who these fantastic, amazing patrons and channel members are of Timmy Talks. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?
Ik het als ik het als zomba kan zien.